Now, it may not seem very Episcopal to you this evening, but I thought we would begin the sermon with some congregational participation. So, if you would go in your pew and pick up that lovely red Book of Common Prayer and turn to page 337. Since I have mentioned it a number of times the last couple of weeks, I thought we would begin by saying together the prayer of humble access. Since I've encouraged you to use it, and because it really fits in with Jesus' teaching recorded in John 6, once he said, I am the living bread that came down from heaven, that whoever eats of this bread will live forever, and the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. So together on page 337. We do not presume to come to this thy table, O merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in thy great mercies, mercies, we are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under thy table, but thou art the same Lord, whose property always to have mercy. Grant us therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of thy dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that we may evermore dwell in him and he in us. Amen. What a fabulous prayer. Now, Wikipedia tells us, relax now, you're done. <laughs> just got to listen now, just got to listen. Now, Wikipedia tells us that this prayer finds its root in a prayer of worthy reception, which appeared in the, holy, in the, holy, in the order for communion in 1548 and is retained in the first prayer book during the reign of Edward VI and published in 1549. This poignant prayer is a combination of several sources, borrowing from the liturgy of St. Basil, a, a Gregorian chant, a writings of Thomas Aquinas, and a couple of verses from Holy Scripture, namely Mark 7, verse 28, which is the reply from a woman in speaking to Jesus regarding her unworthiness. And she, and she said, but even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. And also from John 6, 56, from our gospel reading this, this evening, that says, He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. Now, our Anglican prayer of humble access also mirrors a prayer from the Roman rite, which traditionally is said right before receiving communion. You may know it. Um, I also commend this to your use, coming from Matthew 8, 8, when a centurion asked for Jesus' help in healing his son. When Jesus agrees, the centurion says, Lord, I am not worthy that you should come under my roof, but say that only the word and my servant or my soul shall be healed. Two wonderful prayers you may choose to use for your own personal piety as you are invited to come to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Both acknowledging the unworthiness of our reception of such a gift of Jesus' body and blood and both stating our personal desire to abide in and be transformed more and more into the likeness of him who gave himself for us and for every soul that has been created. Now, before we go much further, I must take a little pause and station break to say that if any of you are a bit squeamish when it comes to blood, this sermon does have a wee bit of graphic blood references in it. I kept it around PG, so don't worry. Okay? Because even I have trouble with references to blood. My wife will tell you I fainted at the passion of the Christ. I just can't take it. I just can't take it. So, so, so it's a little easy, but just know that, um, that we're going to talk a little bit about blood. It has been said that the Bible is a book of blood, wholly distinct from all other books for just one reason, namely that it contains blood circulating through every page and in every verse, from Genesis to Revelation, we see the stream of blood. Now, just in case inquiring minds wanted to know how many times the word blood appears in the Bible, a quick Google search came back with the answer 586 times. Throughout Scripture, the word blood is used. Now, with a religion based on much of peace and grace and forgiveness of love, why is it that there's so much graphic stories involving blood 
in our Holy Scriptures. Well, Hebrews says this. Hebrews says, in fact, the law requires that nearly everything be cleansed with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. As we said last week, in the old covenant God made with his people, he commanded them to respect the blood of, that flows within the animal by not eating it and pouring it out first because it is the vehicle of life that comes only from God. But God also required a blood sacrifice for the atonement of the sins of his people. Therefore, he commanded that animals were to be used as sacrifices for the forgiveness of sins, bringing his chosen people back into a right relationship with their God. However, God's plan of salvation for his creation didn't stop with, with Israel. Through his own son, God gave of his own flesh and blood for the atonement of the sins of his created order. It is the blood of Jesus that washes away the stain of a sin-filled and broken world. Now, before 1979, before the revision of the prayer book in 1979, which we have in our pews, the prayer of humble access stated this very clearly at the very end, it added on, and our sinful bodies may be made clean by his body, and our souls washed through his most precious blood. Now, maybe the revisionists thought that language was a little bit too graphic for us, so they dropped it. I don't know. But anyways, it hits, it hit the, it hits the point pretty well. In its entirety, the prayer of humble access might be a little graphic, but it's the truth. For it has also been said, everything about the death of Jesus was bloody. The slapping of his face must have cut his face. The scourge ripped apart his back. The crown of thorns pierced his brow. Blood from his hands and ankles spurted with every blow of the hammer. Blood like, likely oozed from his nose and mouth as he writhed on the cross. Blood and water, and water gushed from his side when the lance tore him apart. It was not a bloodless death. It was a death designed to paint the cross crimson. To us, this language of eating and drinking Jesus' body and blood falls upon deaf ears because we have no real grid for this kind of imagery. But the Jews would have picked up on this and rightly questioned Jesus' words because of what they had been taught in the Old Testament. Yet Jesus is saying, Unless you eat of my flesh and drink of my blood, you have no life within you. Essentially saying to his fellow Jews, you must take my life into the very center of your life. And as you do, you are taking in the very life of God. This is not to say that we become God, but as I stated last week, we become God-filled. Filled with the likeness of God. This the Jews would have understood, for in the Old Testament sacrifices, only a small portion of that sacrifice was actually on the altar and burned up. The rest was given to the priests who were given for food and to the family and friends who offered the sacrifice. They would take that back home and have a celebration that God had forgiven their sins. And as they all ate, they believed that they were receiving in physically the presence of God in the sacrifice becoming holy as he is holy. This last week, I had the opportunity with um, Ruth back in the back to serve down at St. Matthew's house on the dinner line. How many people have ever served at St. Matthew's house? It's a fabulous thing to do. If you can, please do it. It's wonderful to go down there. And I've been impressed on the type of food that has been served down there. Very good food. One, one night, it was even steaks. I couldn't believe it. Well, this night was no different. There was a fabulous meat-filled spaghetti full of meat. The guys loved it. Along with it, a lovely mix of dark green vegetables, huge chunks of zucchini, squash, gigantic Brussels sprouts, lots of asparagus, and tons of broccoli. It looked great. It smelled great. But to my surprise, there were a lot of guests who passed on the vegetables. So much so that I began to try to sell the veg, saying, now, now you know, guys, the ladies really dig guys who eat their vegetables. And I reminded them of Popeye, who said, I'm strong to the finish because I, I eat my spinach, right? It's good for us. We are what we eat. What we put in is what we get out. If they're only eating spaghetti and 
three desserts, it's not going to be a good situation. Well, some of the people, I got to take some veg. Others just looked with disgust at the, at the, at the greens. One gentleman even asked me, tongue-in-cheek, have you tried it? I, I said no, but I had to afterwards, right, Ruth? I ate some of that. I, I tried it. It looked good, it smelled good, and it did taste good. And I actually saw the gentleman afterwards in the parking lot, and I said to him, I said, I did actually try that vegetable, and it was really good. And I said, you should try it as well. That night, as I was just trying to have a little fun with the, with the ladies and gentlemen who were, who were serving for a hot meal, um, I did so, but on the other hand, I was really hitting that old saying, we are what we eat. Our bodies run much better when we eat a balanced diet of veg along with our meat spaghetti. If we only eat junk, we're going to feel like junk, and our bodies aren't going to be working well all that long. But if we eat good whole foods made of the building blocks that our body needs, we feel better and we live better, right? And this is also what Jesus is getting in our gospel lesson. We are what we eat. And he is urging his followers to abide in him, to draw on him, saying, those who eat my flesh and drink my blood abide in me and I in them. We are God-filled with the likeness of God. Therefore, before Jesus painted the cross crimson red, he took bread, he took wine with his disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for remembrance of me. Generally, when we say we are what we eat, we do so as a reminder to help ourselves and others eat better. Well, fundamentally, if we say that we are as we eat as Christians, we mean that as we take and eat of the consecrated bread and wine, we are taking in the very life of Jesus, that we may be more and more like him. Christians are people belonging to Christ. Why? We worship, we pray, We center, we study the word, we learn from saints who have gone before us, we partake in the sacraments, most especially the Holy Eucharist, taking and eating that we may be more like him who we feast upon, that we would have godly eyes, eyes that see no division between Jew or Gentile, neither slave nor free, neither male or female, but to know that we are all one in Christ Jesus. We feast on our Lord Jesus Christ, abiding in him to have godly minds, filled with the truths of God, being convinced that nothing can separate us from the love of God, neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today nor our worries about tomorrow. Not even the power of hell can separate us from God's love. We feast on our Lord Jesus Christ and abide in him who have godly tongues, that no unwholesome word would proceed from our mouths, but only such words as is good for the edification of the body, so that it will be that we that we will have grace to those who hear. We feast on the Lord Jesus Christ, and we abide in Him and He in us, that we may have godly ears to hear the very voice of God and the will to be obedient. We feast on our Lord Jesus Christ, and we abide in him and he in us, then we have godly hearts that hold dear the truth of God Almighty, that it is by grace that we have been saved through faith. And this is not from ourselves. It is a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. We feast on our Lord Jesus Christ. We abide in him that we may be transformed in body, and soul, and set apart as his forever. For as scripture says, we are not our own. We were bought at a price. And because, brothers and sisters, we know in our inmost being that we are what we eat, being God-filled with the fullness of God Almighty, we receive Jesus' body and blood that we may abide in him and he in us, forever being changed in every way, into his likeness, to God's glory and honor. Amen.